Welcome to Strength Roots Podcast, presented by Hyperthrive Athletics, where we dissect the mindsets, stories, habits, and tactics of elite performers. Strength Roots Podcast, the growth starts here. All right, guys. So today we're sitting down with uh, CJ Appenzeller. He runs Appenzeller Training Systems out in New Jersey. Um, he works heavily with baseball players. He's doing a lot of good things out there. So just wanted to uh, take a minute to kind of talk in-season training with him for our baseball athletes. So thanks for being on here. Absolutely, man. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm fired up. So first thing I kind of want to dig into is just kind of like the big rocks that you're looking to hit as far as weight room work um, in-season. Yep. Um, some things that you may be trying to stay away from. And if you want to split this up into position players versus pitchers, we can do that as well. Or we can just kind of cover a general broad uh, description yeah. of what you're looking to accomplish. Yeah. I mean, number one, like in season for me, the goal is to do no harm, right? That's the goal all year round, but more so than any other time of the year is like, Hey, our weight room work, our, our work in the gym can't take away from competition practice and skill development. Right? So for me, Exercises that minimize eccentric stress is huge. Exercises that are familiar to the athlete and in familiar ranges of motion are huge. And anything that we can do to move them on the opposite side of the absolute strength, absolute speed continuum is important as well. So, you know, for a normal training session with a guy in the off season, we might be hitting, you know, a high volume of medicine ball rotational work. We might be hitting a high volume or a moderate volume of sprint work. In season, we're not going to do nearly as much of that stuff simply because they're working on that side of the spectrum anyway, each and every day in their sport. And uh, really, we're trying to create balance, both from a neurological standpoint, but also from a muscular standpoint. Uh, to that end, you know, the muscular side of things, right, we have this very specific insult to tissues in season, right? We have a very specific system that's constantly used, and we have to try to, the best we can, create some balance there. Now, we're never going to truly create balance, right? Like, you're not going to balance out 103 pitches that have, were just being thrown by, like, doing external rotation work with the band. But you want to try to create as much balance as possible to keep the athlete on the field and healthy. Uh, in terms of like exercise selection, again, stuff that is super, super simple and that we can get done without a ton of coaching, number one. And number two, that's uh, relatively uh, not new to the athlete. Like don't introduce a brand new exercise. Don't introduce a brand new, inter uh, like some type of interval thing to a guy in season. We don't want him sore, right? So whatever way we have to do that to minimize that stress, we will. Last thing I'd say about that is like in season, we run six week waves of exercise selection. And I know guys really, really like, you know, the changing of exercises. And I just talk to them like, hey, what's the goal? You know, is the goal to like be interested in the gym and to like change exercise or is the goal to perform optimally on the field? And if that's the goal and we have to change exercises less, again, minimize the stress, minimize the soreness. We do like an intro week in week one, week two, three, four, five build, and then week six, like a true deload week before we re-intro new exercises the following week. So I don't know if that answered the question at all, but that's exactly how we run like our exercise selection piece of in season stuff for guys and then as far as weekly scheduling like when guys should be programming um you know games and practices versus when they're lifting and specifically yep. for pitchers versus position player guys and guys who are playing every day how should someone kind of schedule what they're doing in the gym yep so this is like the hardest hurdle we have guys uh have to jump over right because number one now just from a time perspective i still have school if i'm a student athlete you know aside from the pro side of things I still have school. I still have to get that stuff done. No teacher is going to be like, hey, don't do your homework this the next two months because you're in season, right? And number two, we still have to get you over to the gym and get you training because we know it's important. So number one, I like to keep in-season workouts very short. They might come in, warm up, foam roll, do all that stuff, and then get out the door inside of 40 minutes some days. That's yeah. just what it is. I want to get them in and out. I want to make sure we get the stimulus we need. And then again, go recover, number one. Number two, um, starting pitchers are, are a little bit easier, especially in high school, right? To program, want to consolidate stressors as much as possible. So either the night they threw or the very next day, we want to get them going. And I always talk about with guys, I'm like, Hey, listen, if you have to fight Mike Tyson twice or three times in one week, right? Where do you want to fight him? Do you want to fight him on Monday and Friday and get your ass kicked twice and then come back and do it again on Monday? Or do you want to just fight him Monday night, Monday morning, and then, Hey, wait until next Monday to go again, right? Yeah. So for me, I want to consolidate those stressors as much as possible. Position guys, a little different. Obviously, guys are playing every day. So for me, there's two things. Number one, I want to provide as much structure as possible. Where there's chaos, provide structure. That was something we talked about off camera just quickly. 
right? So if we can get into a rhythm, almost regardless of what's going on in terms of competition, I think that's going to be the most beneficial. And then myself as the coach, I'll make the, I'll make the changes in terms of like, Hey, I'm going to compete tomorrow versus, Hey, I have a practice day tomorrow. Right. I'll make the changes to the program that are necessary, but I want to provide as much structure as possible. So we try to get guys in two days a week at a minimum. Um, a lot of guys love Sunday mornings because in Jersey, for whatever reason, about like 75% of the team don't practice on Sundays. So we, we like to use that and use that time to get in here and get one of their workouts in. And then their second workout is going to be Tuesday or Wednesday night, depending on again, competition schedule, but provide as much structure as possible, try to get them in a rhythm of it. So if we are getting sore, Hey, at least we're in the soreness rhythm and we know when we're going to be sore and when we can optimize that and, you know, go from there. Yeah. I think structure is huge. You know, a lot of guys or some guys get into the rut. It's like they'll have a little bit of flexibility one week and then the next week gets super heavy. So they might not work out for a week and a half in between, you know, sessions. And that's where it can get a little tricky. And, you know, obviously a lot of soreness comes in and, and, you know, on field performance gets damaged a little bit. So for sure, kind of, you know, now transitioning a little bit more to the nutrition side of stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, preparation, preaching preparation is a huge thing for us with our athletes and making sure guys are prepared because um, it's when they walk out of the door without a plan is the, you know, the times where crap happens, you know, as far as nutrition side of stuff. So talking a little bit about habits or preparation, what are kind of the, some of the tips that you're giving your guys to stay on track? Yeah. So number one, I think like driving home the message that this will make a difference right? Because guys think they can eat whatever. And part of that is like their teammates eat whatever. And I always say, well, that's great. You know, all of your teammates aren't going to play division one sports. All of your teammates aren't going to be pro athletes, right? But you have to, if you want to reach that level and you have to act like you want to reach that level, you have to act like you're already there. So preparation is key, right? We have all of our guys buy thermos food jars, which are awesome. You know, Amazon, they're $21. Okay. I have all of our guys take their school lunch in there. And for most of these guys, we're recommending monster mash at some level for their school lunch which is essentially white rice, red meat, some spinach, some grass-fed butter, throw it in there, right? Again, we talk to these guys about being prepared on their day off. Whatever their day off is of that week, well, guess what? Your best workout, the most important workout, so to speak, that you could do is prepare your food, especially for my pitchers later in the season, right? The number one cause of inconsistent pitching velocity is trying to pitch in a caloric deficit. So not only is this going to make a direct impact on how you feel, how you think, how you optimize your training and competition, but it can also directly impact your velocity on the mound. And all of a sudden guys are listening, right? They're like, Oh, wait, wait a second. <laughs> I can't have my velo drop off. I'll make it happen. So recommend that we do recommend, uh, recommend like post-workout shakes and things like that. And I drive home the idea that like training is obviously working out, but so is competing, right? So, Cause so many guys miss that. They're like, Oh, like I come off the baseball field. It feels different than when I come off, you know, the training floor. Well, both are, equally taxing in different ways and we have to refuel after so we have guys do post-workout shakes and i know you know one of the big things people ask me is like what's the most important thing they can do after an outing for a pitcher well dude i think eating a, eating a perfect meal drinking a post-workout shake and maybe restoring some range of motion is probably the most important thing so i mean that's how we're, we're getting these guys going driving home how important it is number one number two making sure they find time to prepare their meals each and every day and then number three, bringing a really good school lunch that's high level and treating yourself like a high level athlete, even though you're not there quite yet. Yeah. Yeah. I love that monster mash concept. And it's so easy for an athlete. I mean, if you have a crock pot, you throw all of those ingredients in there together. It takes you 10 minutes to prepare and it's done immediately for you. And it's delicious. It's not yeah. like, like, it's not even like you're missing anything, you know? Yeah. yeah. So you hit, you started to kind of talk about it a little bit. Obviously nutrition plays a big role in, you know, post throw routine. Um, so talking specifically pitchers, let's say a guy maybe threw three plus innings. Yep. Um, what are some things you're looking to do directly after his outing, you know, that day, uh, plus maybe the next day, what are some big rocks you're looking to achieve there? Yeah. So as soon as a guy comes off the slope, I think the, the norm, so to speak, is to run poles, do a ton of band exercises. I think those two things combined are probably the worst thing a guy can do coming off the slope. Uh, number one, like poles and all that stuff, that long distance style, aerobic style conditioning doesn't match the energy system needs of the athlete, number one. And number two, probably does more harm than good in terms of most of my guys need to keep weight on, right? So for me, if you're going to come off the field and do something, I immediately want you to address like loss range of motion. So we know from an acute bout of throwing that we're going to lose some shoulder internal rotation. We know we're going to lose hip total motion. So if you're going to do anything, I want you to address that immediately, right? 
uh, address the, the loss of internal, internal rotation of the shoulder, address the hips, get those things moving again, and then I want you to drink your shake and chill out. If you're used to doing band stuff, and this is like kind of that, that gray area, if you're used to doing band stuff because you always do it post throw and you have the entire off season, then definitely do that. But in season is not the time to take your band work at the field like up, right? You don't want to raise that volume. We're already insulting these tissues. We're already doing more damage to the shoulder than normal. So we don't want to continue to just drive up volume there. I would definitely steer clear of doing more stuff that looks like throwing. That's what I tell our guys. So like doing plyo work after you throw is like counterintuitive. Doing internal rotation exercises on bands is probably counterintuitive, right? We need to do the opposite. Again, try to create balance, number one. And number two, be as careful as possible about driving up the volume or that insult to that, uh, to that area already. If we're going to have guys condition, I want it to match uh, the actual energy systems demands of the sport. So for us, like some of the schools I consult with, they have to do something after. Like that is part of like the pitching coach's mentality, part of the staff's mentality. So for those guys, we're doing what we would call neural charge circuits. These are essentially very low repetition, high intensity power outing, outing style circuits with some type of short sprint, some type of medicine ball throw, and some type of jump involved. Um, they're going to do these with as much recovery as needed and through it, you know, minimally two, three, maybe four rounds of two to five repetitions, right? They're not going to do a lot of stuff. Um, for rotational med ball work, we do a ton of offside rotational med ball throwing. Uh, again, create balance. Try to try to balance out the structure as best as possible. But we do not do a ton of rotational med ball work to the strong side or to the to the dominant side there. So we'll put that into that neural charge circuit as well. Sweet, cool. So, like I said, we kind of want to make this a, a quick call. Is there anything else that you would you know just kind of want to add off the top of your head that we didn't cover? Uh, yeah, the one thing, the one thing I, I do want to address just in terms of recovery modalities, cause it's getting so popular in baseball now, like everybody's like, should I, should I not ice? Should I heat? Should I not heat? Do I use a Mark Pro? Do I use this or that? So I'll tell you like my stance on all this stuff is that in the off season, it should be minimally used, right? Whether it's Mark Pro, Norma Tech, any of that stuff, right? Because it starts to really change that stimulus adaptation recovery curve, right? I can't adapt if I'm constantly rushing the recovery period of my training. But now in season, I talk about in season, like, hey, it's time to compete now. So I'm in. I'm in for recovery modalities. I love Mark Pro. It's awesome. I love the Norma Tech sleeves and, and legs. I love that stuff. It's awesome. I am totally on the opposite side of the fence in terms of icing. I don't really see a reason to ice. Uh, if you're icing something because it hurts, I think there's a bigger issue there, number one. Number two, if you're icing something to clear out lactic acid or any combination of those kind of buzzwords, I think you're, you misunderstand how that process actually works. Yeah. I think movement and restoring that motion that we lost acutely is going to be the big key. So uh, for me, I love Mark Pro. I love those active recovery modalities, but only in season. So just be aware of where you use them. If you get nine months into the year and you're still using a Mark Pro every single time you train or throw, there's probably something else going on there, number one. And number two, you're adapting to it. Number yeah. three, you're, you're really starting to affect your stimulus adaptation recovery curve. You're not getting as much out of your training as you could because you're not giving yourself that time. So yeah. I think, I think that's yeah. something important because it's so popular. Yeah. That's like an old uh, Soviet track thought as well. Like they, all the recovery mod modalities, they save that until it was a necessity and then you use it. So you get more of a, a stimulus and an adaptation from actually using yes. the modalities. Yeah. yeah, man. Yeah. I think like we're, we're so worried about recovery. Like yeah. most guys aren't training. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. like, like wh why are we using all this stuff off season? We're not even really training that hard, you know, yeah. but. That's, that's kind of like uh, my, my soapbox moment, so to speak. There you go. I appreciate the time. If people want to get in contact with you or um, find out more of kind of your philosophy and what you guys are doing, where should they follow you? Yep. Best place is Instagram. I'm, I'm at happy hour. So happy hour with no H. Sweet. Perfect. Easy. All right, guys. Well, thanks for the time. Hopefully you got some value from this and uh, stay focused, even though we're in season. Later.